all of, all of our projects need inspiration. They need some sort of muse that drives teams to do great things. We've seen a couple people present today. It's either mountains or self-exploration. And uh, our project's no different. We have that inspiration. Now, this is an abstract art and the lens isn't out of focus. It's a big pile of couch and, it's, and it stinks. It's, a, it's filthy and fly-ridden. And it, we're really excited about it. Now, this is something that, like sometimes I'm driving down the street and I get a whiff of crap and it smells really bad and I start thinking about a brighter future. And it's, and it's really exciting. And I know that that's kind of hard for you guys to understand. So I wanted to do this presentation in 4D, um, let a little bit of that smell waft out into the crowd and, and maybe even splatter some of the people in the front row. But that wasn't that great an idea. So what um, I decided to do was try if I could uh, share a little bit of our story with you and see if we could sort of move that along. Now, um, it's important that we realize that caca, crap, poop, <laughs> shit, feces, it all has lots of names, but one of those names should not be waste. Because waste is a state of mind, it's a concept that fundamentally lacks creativity and vision. It's a concept that is not that useful. So. Let me get back to that, because when I start talking about crap, I just automatically think of food, right? Well, more like our food production system, because it's actually the love of great food that started my love affair with manure. So um, I love small farmers. Uh, I love small farms. My mom was a small organic farmer. When I was a kid, I got to sell produce with her in our town center. Basically, from that point on, I started to realize the hard work and love and dedication that goes into producing food. And I think that that's why I fell in love with Mexico. In these same valleys where we're all living today, thousands of years ago, there was this incredible agricultural innovation happening. And these were small farmers, not so different from my mom, producing amazing food. This food production system that they innovated has basically produced some of the most robust and delicious food ever. Um, unfortunately, uh, today, that's been a little bit distorted. Even though a lot of their innovations are still from the basis of our food production system, the last 50 years has produced a new system that's really dependent on energy and chemicals and all of these other inputs to the agricultural system that disregard this, this pathway, this 12,000 years of R&D and organic agriculture that we had before that. So we're at this really interesting crossroads in Mexico because about half of our food comes from this 99% of the farmers, these small farmers. The other half of the food becomes from this 1% of large industrial farmers. So we're really at this point where we need to decide where do we want our food to come from? Unfortunately, the line between the small farmer and the large farmer has been a little blurred. Um, even really small farmers are actually using massive amounts of chemical fertilizers on their fields. Now, they've been sort of lured down this pathway of development to follow these advanced agricultural practices. Now, these are really, really independent people. They grow their own food. They live off the land. I have this great honor to be able to work with them, but I also like to challenge them a little bit. So one of the things I always do is ask two questions. What's your most important agricultural input? Chemical fertilizers. Okay, where does it come from? Do you make it? Do your neighbors make it? Does someone in the state make it? Does someone in your country make it? Adios. Do the gringos make it? Where does this come from? So I did a little bit of research, and it turns out that most of the chemical fertilizers here come from Russia, China, India, maybe Canada, maybe the United States, but they come from really far away. So the reality is we don't control our agricultural inputs, so we don't control our agriculture. Now, the other thing I find really interesting about chemical fertilizers is they, they kill our soil. So we actually have a grow plants that kill soil that the plants grow in. It's completely absurd, but the reality. I realized this at the same time I realized that most of the agricultural lands in Mexico are sterile, devoid of life, they're dead. So today in Mexico, without chemical fertilizer, ancient corn will not grow. Now, organic soils have these thousands of bacterias and, and uh, mushrooms and fungus and a whole host of larger uh, insects and worms, and they're able to break down minerals, break down organic substances, and actually make it available for plants so that they grow. So when, that's why organic food's so good for you, because it's a product of this really complex ecosystem. You know, soils cannot make this minerals or these nutrients available for plants. They only allow the chemicals to enter the plant's roots. So when we go to the countryside and we go for una torta hecha a mano, we're actually not absorbing the land or we're not absorbing these nutrients, we're absorbing chemicals from Russia. The absurdity of this industrial agricultural process is really striking. So 
So we, we, we work with small farmers, and the benefit of that is that we get to work with communities and families that grow food. Now, these are people that have no shortage of challenges. One of their challenges is energy. They don't have really good access to renewable, safe, clean, accessible energy. So they're either cutting forests for wood fuel or they're buying LP gas or electricity, it's expensive, and they're not in control of it. Sometimes the gas truck doesn't come, sometimes the power goes out. Also, farming's getting harder. Climate change is present in small farms in Mexico. It's not an abstract policy debate, it's not a political point of view, it's impacting people's lives every day. They deal with floods, they deal with droughts, they deal with freezes, they deal with heat waves, inconsistent rains, they're dealing with hailstorms. These are things that can devastate crops and have a huge impact on families. Now, all of these things can be translated into economic impacts. Small families spending thousands of dollars a year on chemical fertilizers that kill their soil. They're spending tons of money on energy so that they can have this sort of level of sustainability and they're being impacted by this economic dynamic. So with all of these challenges, bing, that's a small farm, that's a big farm that we don't like. <laughs> And these are some of the other challenges. Now, with all these challenges, they also live with this. It's right out their back door. It's just a few steps away from there where they eat and sleep. It's a big pile of crap. It smells bad. It contaminates their water. It contaminates their watershed, kills lakes and streams. So just for good measure, as hard as their life is, they've also got to live with this big steaming pile of nuisance. Now, these are all disincentives to be a small farmer. And this should matter to us because they grow half our food and they grow the good stuff. They grow the heirloom varieties, they grow the criollo, they grow the stuff that we want to eat, they take care of the land and they guard our biodiversity. We don't want small farmers to disappear, we want them to keep farming. At least I do. So that was basically the context with which I started working in a small town in Michoacan about eight years ago. I met this woman named Cayetana Nambo. She had just gotten back from a course in Colombia where she learned about a technology called a biodigester. Now, biodigesters take organic waste, these cow manures, pig manures, maybe even human waste or agricultural waste, and using naturally occurring bacteria in a, in a small container, these, this waste is broken down into a really high potency organic fertilizer. This fertilizer not only gives nutrients to plants, but it's also filled with life. So it starts actually being able to bring the soil back to life. It starts being able to re-engage those natural processes. Now the byproduct of this process is a biogas, a natural gas that's rich in methane that we can actually use for cooking, heating, producing electricity in these small farms. Now I'd heard about the technology, but seeing it applied was really inspiring. The key difference there is I, I, I could see the difference between Cayetana's house and her neighbors. It didn't smell, there weren't flies. She wasn't spending any money on chemical fertilizers, but her beautiful organic field was flourishing. When we returned back to her house, she cooked me food on a big, blue, beautiful biogas flame. And, and I just, it was like I saw the light. I started thinking, God, this stinky byproduct of being a small farmer is actually a boon. These are, these are steaming piles of money just dripping freely from the animal anuses of the world. And, <laughs> And so I started doing a little bit of research. I realized that animals don't actually do a good job digesting their food. About half of it just passes right through them. These, this isn't waste, it's just the food that they're not using. So zooming out from that, I was like, wow, there's like four million of these piles of crap in Mexico, everywhere. We can, we can be using them. There's tens of millions of them in Latin America, 600 million steaming piles of crap around the world in the most marginalized communities and it's a big nuisance for them when it could actually be helping them out. So Cayetana had sort of built this like rustic homemade biodigester system. Uh, it was working, but it kind of looked like a, a bag of shit in her backyard, honestly. Um, so we jumped into some R&D and we decided to build something that was going to work for a Mexican farmer. Robust, long lasting, something that could have an impact in their lives. So we came up with Sistema Via Bolsa. It's this system that we can build and we can ship it anywhere in the world and it can be implied really, really fast. So we can install these in small farms really, really fast and replicate this impact. So we're, we're using this platform of art and education and, and, and our, our, the passion that we have for this thing to try to give farmers both access through microcredit and these other things, but also the motivation to adopt this technology. So with the benefits that they have, they can actually pay off this technology while they're protecting their own watersheds and while they're reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So some of these 
farmers and some of these impacts have really been, really been moving for me. So now I hope you're starting to get an idea why I'm so excited about waste. Because at the end of the day, waste is just a missed opportunity. If I can get so excited about shit, then what other opportunities are we missing? What else is out there? And that's the point. That's what Vita 2.0 is, right? It's about challenging definitions. It's about changing our assumptions about everything. It's about functioning more like life. I would argue Vita 1.0 were natural ecosystems. We represent Vita like 1.7, some weird dysfunctional Windows Vista of a life system that the inputs and outputs aren't lining up. So the point here is that waste is not a useful term because we need to start thinking more like ecosystems. Ecosystems don't have waste. They have inputs, outputs, and the inputs for other processes. There is no waste there. Waste also gives us a really unique opportunity to look into processes. We can tell the efficiency of something that we're doing by how much waste we produce. It also allows us to examine our own values as a society. Why? Some of you are probably asking, there's things that we can't use. There's waste that's not useful, chemical, nuclear waste. This guy's a total idiot. There's not, we can't reuse everything. Then why do we make it? Why do we make things that don't last? Why do we make, why do we use the limited resources we have to make something that's a contaminant and we can't reuse? Why do we make plastic things that form an island in the Pacific Ocean that's contaminating our resources when we use them for a millisecond? Why do we do it? That's what waste gives us the opportunity to examine. We need to confront it, not bury it in the ground. We need to look at it and see what it's saying about us. So what I'd like to leave you with is this. These are some children that have been using a biodigester for three years. They will never remember a time in their life when animal manure wasn't a resource to be valued and directly linked with their food system. They will never know a time when the stinkiest, grossest of all wastes wasn't converted into a big, beautiful blue biogas flame. Their perspective has changed. And I think it's time for all of us to look for the other opportunities we're missing. Gracias.